Hey, happy Sunday, guys. Thanks so much for everything, you guys. I really appreciate you for everything you do. Whether you're supporting my ministry or just tuning in, just being a friend. God bless you. Thank you so much. Hope you're enjoying this wonderful spring weather. Uh, I definitely am. I can feel it coming on. The whole the weather's changing, the vibes changing, and that helps helps a lot. You know, people shouldn't forget to appreciate and be thankful to God for everything. Even though we're at the end times and, you know, the devil's really stepping up his game, so to speak. Really putting the pressure on everybody. Um, it appears he doesn't want people to have time to repent, you know, so. That's why I think it's important for me to try my best to be a faithful minister of the word and a steward of the mysteries of God. And the most important one is the mystery of the gospel. It says, And for me that utterance might be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Uh, Ephesians 6.19 so the mystery of the gospel is the most important mystery. And today I'm going to go over the Apostle Paul and how he was sent by God to preach the mystery of the gospel. That's why he says that verse in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read something out of Ephesians chapter 3. This is a good verse to start, I think, on this whole subject. But I'm going to go to some of the beginning verses of some of the books of Paul's writings of the New Testament, which is the doctrine that we're under for today. It says in chapter 3 of Ephesians, um, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. So that's an important verse. The prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. And that matches Romans 11.13 and Galatians 2.8. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. Both Jews and Gentiles are saved through Christianity, through true faith from the heart in what the Savior did for us. So for 2,000 years, it's all been this uh, expose, this revelation of God's goodness and his love and mercy. This the law is true. Everything God said in the law and the Old Testament is the truth and it's righteous. It's profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. But since we have been unrighteous, as it says for as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because we have not obeyed God, we need Christianity. So, God is very loving, and for the last 2,000 years, it's been a period of grace and love and forgiveness and redemption through Jesus Christ. So, let me continue on. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, so that's a good verse. It uses the word dispensation. And dispensations is a word that applies to the concept of rightly dividing the word of truth, which is a command in 2 Timothy 2.15 from God through Paul, telling us to look at the word of God in context. And that way we can know that God isn't the author of confusion. We know we can't say, oh, well, just because it's in the Bible, that means we have to preach that as the way of salvation. Um, that's how you get every single false doctrine and hypocrite and false cult. All these people who are lacking fruits because they've rejected the apostle God sent to them for the salvation of their soul. And they think, well, since it's in the Bible, it must be true. Well, it's true. And it was true for that time period. And if the Bible's true, then it was true for that time period, and then there's another truth for this time period. So, if there is, since there is another truth for this time period, 
doesn't make that one not true for that time period. It just means there's a, this truth now for today's time period. Yes, the Bible is the word of truth. It says, let God be true and every man a liar. But, you can't just take a verse out of context and say, well, this is what God said. Everything God says is true, and all the scriptures he gives us, past, present, or future, are all profitable scripture. And it's all true, but there's only one gospel of salvation for today. So... I'm going on a little tangent, sort of. I'm trying to explain the importance of rightly dividing. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A lot of people know this verse, and then a lot of people don't know this verse, because there are a lot of verses in the Bible, but I found it extremely useful being pointed out. Second Timothy 2.15, um, I noticed that that had a big part to play in my salvation was when I was able to stand on the gospel preached by Paul and I wasn't looking at the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and some of the things that Jesus says to the Jews in those books and I wasn't once I stopped using those other books to question my salvation to say well look what Jesus said well, that maybe maybe that what maybe because of what he said that means it nullifies what Paul said. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Paul came after Jesus' ministry to the Jews. God sent Paul. That's why it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. To the prisoner of Jesus Christ. So he's a prisoner for Jesus Christ, basically. Because he was in prison very often, so a lot of times he was speaking his epistles from in prison. Um, there were a couple times. Um, so the word dispensation is important. And this verse in, in chapter 3 of Ephesians, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. So this is the dispensation of the grace of God. The law was more of the dispensation of the condemnation uh, because it's through the law that we're condemned that we're condemned to death and the only way out of that death is through the death that Christ took for us Christ having taken that death for us on the cross really simple yeah yeah really 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 simple yeah um, I was talking to my friend the other night and he, he mentioned 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through subtlety. Uh, so you also shall be cor um, corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. <laughs> it says, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So let me continue on here. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And I was reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, Let a man so account of, uh, of us as the stewards of the mysteries of God. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. I knew I was leaving out something. Um, <clears throat> so let me continue here. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So, it wasn't known in the Old Testament, but now is revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. 
So there's things from every apostle and prophet that we can take benefit from. And we learn about the knowledge and the mystery of Christ. But look what it says right here, though. It does specify that it's we are to understand his knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That's why it says, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So he says that ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That's why he says in chapter 6, and for me that evidence may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. It says that right at the end, end of Ephesians right here. And Ephesians is a wonderful book. It talks about the blood. Ephesians 1 7. And, and it talks about the grace. Ephesians 1 6. And Ephesians 2 8 through 9. And there's another verse right here in Ephesians chapter 1. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, you might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So this is talking about the rapture. And the rapture comes in this dispensation. This is the dispensation of the fullness of times. And I believe that's because salvation is available through faith in Christ. It's a wonderful time period. Anybody who's born after Christ can be saved. And, you know, it really is this come-as-you-are type of thing. Um, it's not us who redeems us. If that were the case, we could not be redeemed because anything we do isn't worthy enough because we've already sinned. We've already sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we need the redemption in Christ. And through Christ, we are redeemed because it's not us redeeming us. It's God redeeming us, you see. So, it says, I'm skipping around a little bit, but dispensations are really important. And Paul is an important apostle for today, the most important apostle for today. And he'll be important in the future, too, because I believe that in the future, people will have to look back at Paul's writings and still be founded on the faith that he preaches. But they'll have to understand that faith without works is dead, like it preaches in the book of James to them in the future. In the future, and right in the first verse of James, it says, To the twelve tribes scattered, which are scattered abroad, greeting. So the twelve tribes of Israel. And then James comes right after the book of Hebrews, and there's a pretty distinct difference in doctrine. It sounds closer to the endure to the end doctrine that Jesus preaches to the Jews, the Hebrews. Um but it also talks about faith in the blood. That's why in the future, people who are left behind will have to have both faith and works. So just rejecting the mark of the beast and rejecting the Antichrist system is all well and good, and it's important, and you won't be saved without doing it. But you also won't be saved if you don't have faith in the blood of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. And that's why it goes into that uh, in the books of Peter and in Hebrews. It talks about the blood in both Hebrews and in Peter. And it may be more of a focus on the blood and the atonement. And it talks about how the grace is revealed at the end once they endure to the end. So they're going to have to have faith and works. And that's much more complicated and more difficult than just having faith for salvation. Um, there's more scriptures that they're going to have to observe like First John one nine, uh, they're gonna have to confess their sins and all that, and really try their best to keep the commandments. And if they don't, they're gonna have to confess their sins, and they'll be washed by the blood. It talks about in First John one nine. So I'm really digressing, but looking at it all in context is really, really, really helpful. Um, so the faith is what saves. Ultimately, it's the faith that saves us. Even in the tribulation, it's the faith that saves us. 
So that's that's a subject I've wanted to go over a little bit too because yes, it's faith and works, but it's not only works, it's faith too. So all the people who are left behind, they got left behind because they didn't have the faith. So you have to let that sink in. You have to understand that. Anybody who uh, thinks that they're going to have to go through the Great Tribulation is going to get what they want, basically. What they believe. If they believe that, that you know, oh, I'm not good enough and I'm, I'm going to be left behind. I'm, I'm such a sinner that I'm not good enough that I'm going to be left behind. If you're thinking it's based upon how good you are, then yes, you will be left behind. But if you trusted fully in the Savior, knowing that you are not good enough, then you will go at the rapture. So it's this funny thing. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe that you won't go at the rapture, that you might be left behind because maybe your works weren't good enough, which they are not, then yes, you'll be left behind. But if you want to go at the rapture, then you can simply believe and trust in the Savior. So let me continue on. Um, it says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That's the promise of eternal life. It says, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, according, uh, sorry, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So again, he's specifying his preaching to the Gentiles. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And there's some other great verses. Um, it says, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. I really like that verse. And it, that kind of goes in, hand in hand to this verse uh, in Ephesians 1 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. So his will is what he purposed in himself. So God on purpose through his will made known the mystery according to his good pleasure. So it can be a lot, but when you break it down, you can you can sort of see um, it's talking about how it's God and it was his will to make salvation by faith in the gospel and that is to his good pleasure and he purposed it in himself and I already went over verse 10 of chapter 1 of Ephesians um, so let's go over a couple more verses um, 1 Corinthians Chapter 11, verse 1 says, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So, let me read some of the first verses of some of the chapters here. It says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. So Paul was called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. That's what it says. And it says here in 
chapter 15 of Romans. It says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers that their Messiah, sorry, promises made unto the fathers, which was that their Messiah would come and that he would uh, bear their stripes and he'd be wounded for their transgressions, as it says in Isaiah chapter 53. It says, and that the Gentiles may, sorry, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and load him, all ye people. And again, as I saith, there shall be a root of Jesse. And he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. So we're trusting in him. And that's how he reigns over us. It says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So, so... So many times the Bible tells us to rejoice and to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. The Bible is this beautiful, harmonious book. All the scriptures harmonize with each other. Even if they might be to different time periods, specifically, there's still verses within scriptures to different peoples at different time periods that are helpful to all time periods. And now we've been given all of the scriptures. You know, there was there was a time in the Old Testament where they didn't have what we have today. So that's kind of interesting. So we can really benefit from everything God gave us today more even than the Old Testament prophets, which is a wonderful beautiful thing. And the fact of the matter is it's all through faith in what Jesus did. It's not so much about how studied we are and how smart we are. Uh, we study in order to lead people to the Lord. That's all it is. Because it's such a good thing that we want to share with other people. It's not about how wise we are. It says professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Um, let me continue. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So Romans chapter 15 is a wonderful chapter because it reminds us that we are filled with all joy and peace in believing. And why do we have joy and peace through believing? Because knowing that it's simply believing that saves us means that we know that we're saved, and that's why we have joy and peace. <laughs> so it's it's really a wonderful thing. You know, i got to constantly stay reminded and focused on how awesome what it is being a Christian really means. Uh, and that happens to be you know, all the best inspiration for my music and wanting to preach and all that, you know. The word is a wonderful thing, you know. It says, in God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. Um, so it says, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you, in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that their offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So ministering the gospel of God. 
the gospel of Christ. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It says in Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, after also that which ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15.1-4. And it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. How was he died, and he shed his blood. So it's all through what Jesus did. And it's simply knowing that, having faith in that, means you know that you're saved, and that's why we have the peace and joy in believing. I love Romans chapter 15. Um, So let me continue. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little. Read a couple verses at the end of Romans chapter 16. So this is at the very end of Romans. Romans is one of the most important books in the whole entire Bible. Because it's the first book we hear about the gospel. And we hear the whole gospel in Romans. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us and outlines exactly what the gospel was. And that it's the gospel that saves us. But we do hear the gospel in Romans. Romans 5 8 through 11, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 11, um, Romans 3, 25. You know, we hear all the parts of the gospel, the blood, the death, burial, and resurrection. And it's, you know, the scriptures do say it, you know. It's, Romans is scripture. That's why it says according to the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But it also matches the Old Testament scripture, how Jesus fulfilled those prophecies that it talks about in Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53, all that. So it says in Romans chapter 16, verse 24, it says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is po of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God to make known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. And remember Romans 10, verse 16, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So the obedience of faith. To obey is to believe. Because that's what the Bible says is the way of salvation for today. So a person who doesn't fear God is going to say, Well, but it's also this or this and that and your water baptism and you have to repent. And it's also this and just belief isn't enough, you know. And, and what they're doing is they're not believing. They're not believing the gospel and they're disobeying the gospel, they're disobeying God, they're disobeying the Bible, they are being rebellious by demanding that their own works, something they do, anything they do, has any part to play in them being saved. And all this does is drive people away from salvation, you know. Christianity is this type of thing that, um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot since I got saved, and it's pretty much all I think about, because I know that the Bible's true, so I know that Ultimately, you know, whether or not a person goes to heaven or hell is all that actually matters. Um, and I'm basing this knowledge off of knowing the Bible is true. And so what it's saying about there being heaven and hell matters. And that's ultimately the only thing that really matters. So Christianity is, is for everybody, basically. Like either a person is going to go to heaven or to hell... And that's a big deal. But the thing is, it's so simple to avoid hell. It's by faith in what God himself in the flesh already did for all of mankind. John 3.16. So here it talks about, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, 
according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. You see, Paul is also a prophet. He prophesies the rapture in chapter 4 of Thessalonians and the rise of the Antichrist in chapter 5. Um, or sorry, in chapter 2 of Second Thessalonians, but it's hinted upon that whole time period. It's hinted upon in chapter 5 of Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. Um, so let's read right here the beginning of the book of Romans. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So the gospel of God was promised through the Old Testament Scriptures. Isaiah chapter 53 is a famous example. Um... It might be one of the best examples, if not the best example. It says, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And it says in Romans chapter 15, that same chapter, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So, it's a wonderful thing. You know, the Bible is proven true. We believe the Bible because it's proven by prophecy. And so that's why we believe the gospel when it says it's by faith alone. And that's why I preach faith alone. You know, and, uh, you know, I'm really against sin, too. I don't think that means that we... Oh, that means anybody can just go out and sin. And people try to turn it around and say, well, doesn't that mean I can just go out and sleep around and smoke? and drink, and blah, 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 blah. It's like, yes, technically you can do those things, but you shouldn't. Especially sleeping around. Fornication in particular is bad. Things that people enjoy, that's talked about more in Romans chapter 14. It says, Have thou faith, have it to thyself before God. Happy is he which condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned of feet, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So that's in Romans chapter 14, right before Romans chapter 15. Right at the end of Romans chapter 14, it talks about that. So it's not so much about what we do. It's more about what Jesus did, because the fact is, one way or another, we're sinners. Um... But that doesn't mean I'm promoting sin. I love God's word. I love everything God says. Um, you know, like it says in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. People who preach the simplicity of salvation through belief in Christ are not telling people to go out and do wickedly and just be as bad of a person you can be because... All you have to do is just believe in God. It means you'll be saved. Yes, all you have to do is believe in the gospel and you'll be saved. So that should show you how much God loves you. So that should make you want to read God's word and love him and obey it. So I'm tired of that conversation of somebody saying that because I preach it's by belief alone and not asking Jesus into your heart. Or some heresy that contradicts the scriptures, what they literally actually say, it doesn't mean I'm saying that to go sin. There's all these other scriptures that tell us that we should live righteously. And I agree with those scriptures. Do I live up to them all the time? Of course not. I'm a sinner. I deserve hell, just like everybody else. I'm no better than anybody else. This is why the gospel is for everyone. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus himself says that. The thief on the cross was saved simply by believing. At the very last moments of his life, he was saved. So that means anyone can get saved. It's all about how good God is, not how good we are. But there's, you know, most people don't know the true gospel because there's a lot of self righteous hypocrites who use God's name to lift and exalt themselves. Um, 
It says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. I love that verse. It's, it's so telling of the, the hypocrites. Um, there's always this vibe of negativity behind them. Um, you know, I know there's such a thing as righteous judgment, and I believe in it, and I practice it, you know. I'm against wickedness. I'm not a proponent of doing harm to other people in any way, shape, or form. I think everything the Bible says is true. I love it. I've been made awake and aware to truth and to righteousness through the Bible. And I love God, not only for having saved me, because I have not lived up to what the Bible says, but I also love him for telling me what the right way to live is so that I do better, so that I can feel better about myself on some levels, even though I still feel bad about all my sins in the past. But I'm glad I've done better, especially having gotten more and more serious with God. Um, you know, a friend I met online says, uh, you know, she says, salvation is a one-time event, but spiritual growth is a process. You know, I like that. That was a good little quote um, from my friend uh, Rebecca. Um, and uh, it's true, you know. No one's perfect. I, and I'm ashamed for all my sins, but it was through the Bible that I was led to that. And through that being ashamed of sins, I have uh, been led to a cleaner life, a life of repentance and stuff. I have a repentant heart. Does that save me? Not at all. No, not at all. Not at all. Nope. But I'm going to keep having a repentant heart, knowing that it's Jesus alone that saved me. And not the fact that I have a repentant heart. You see, it's not how good I am. That's the reason I'm saved. It's belief. So, you know, the scriptures are, it's almost like, it's so much for people. But when they realize how simple what it's saying is, it makes it easier for them to simply just believe what it's saying. That's basically what's going on many times. People, it says something clearly, but people don't believe it. That's why the Bible says belief is what saves us. But if you're reading the scriptures and not believing what they say, then, you know, how can you believe the gospel if you don't even believe the Bible when it says that it's the gospel that saves <laughs> It's this mystery. It's, it's, that's why I started this off talking about with the mystery, because the mystery of faith is really quite an interesting mystery. It says, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. It's not anything we do. That's what's so mysterious. But we can be saved by having faith in what he did. So it's moving from vanity to glory in God. That's almost what this whole battle of the world is about. Um, you know, the world lifting people up, the more they live in vanity, or the world rejecting them the more they glorify God. You know, that's what's going on in the world, at least. Um, the reason we glorify God is because we've been blessed enough to have learned the scriptures and have been led to salvation through having heard the scriptures and having heard the gospel and having believed the gospel. Um, it says in Romans chapter 10, How then shall I call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall I believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So. Yeah, I think I went over some good verses today. Uh, the video is getting a little long here. Um, so. Let me finish it off reading again um, a couple more verses. I'm going to read some verses talking about Paul being the apostle of the Gentiles. Um, we'll start off here in Romans 1.13. It says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. 
I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The more you read what the Bible is actually saying, the more you see how you don't live up to the Bible, the more you see how good of news it is that the just shall live by faith. We're made just through faith in the one who died for the unjust. It says the just for the unjust. So, there's a lot more scriptures I should be going over. For, over um, it says, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah, for scarcely for a righteous man one will die. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So it's telling us about what's happening once we believe. Once we believe in the blood, we're justified by the blood. And we shall be saved from wrath through him. And we're reconciled to God by the death of his son when we're enemies. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we're saved by his life 